The title is clickbait. Yes, I will discuss the Dragons are Nukes talking point, but I will not tell you when I'm going to do it, so that you give me watch time. What I want to analyze in this video is dragons as a whole. Dragons in fantasy, dragons in myth, dragons as a cultural phenomenon, and especially dragons in A Song of Ice and Fire. Because, for whatever reason, in spite of being cool as fuck, this fandom harbors some irrational hatred towards them. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. Also, you can listen to this episode on Spotify. Check the link in the description. What is even a dragon? And how come they are present in so many different cultures that never interacted with one another? Draconica.com, which is a page solely dedicated to various aspects of dragons, defines them as such. Dragons are mythical creatures that appear in many different cultures and time periods. Dragons have been described as monsters, serpents, reptiles, or beasts. There is something magical about dragons that has kept our intrigue over many centuries. Dragons are usually thought to have wings and breathe fire. They also are said to have scales and claws. Some also have horns. Almost always they are said to be venomous. Some dragons may have two or more heads. They may also have more than one tail. They may have two, four or even more legs. However, most are known to have four legs. Dragons have been present in so many different cultures that it's almost surprising, especially since a lot of them appeared in myths from places so far from each other that it's strange that they've all thought of the same thing. Dragon myths were featured in some of the oldest recorded civilizations, for example in Mesopotamia, whose mythology mentions a primordial goddess Tiamat that took the form of a draconic-like creature. Dragon-related myths were present in many European and East Asian cultures as well, though they were much different from one another. We will elaborate on it later. The most likely reason as to why so many cultures around the world believed in dragons was probably that they all encountered dinosaur skeletons at some point, especially the flying ones, like the pterosaur. Dragons are usually reptiles, just like dinosaurs, which also explains their reptilian anatomy, scales, sharp teeth and whatnot. The association of European dragons with fire probably came from volcanoes and other such places because dragons were often believed to live in mountains and guard some treasures there. In various myths and stories, dragons are presented as intelligent creatures with human-like intelligence and personality. In spite of now being associated mostly with fire, at first dragons were associated with water creatures. Perhaps due to the existence of serpentine creatures often encountered by the sailors, and some cultures still conceptualize them as connected to water rather than fire. The connection with sea serpents that a lot of dragons seem to have also points in the direction of dinosaurs, since some of them, like plesiosaurs, were sea creatures with elongated bodies. This distinction between fire dragons and water dragons is especially visible when we look at how different cultures conceptualize dragons, particularly in the distinction between the West and the East. Chinese culture especially values dragons, seeing them as a symbol of wisdom, power and luck, and unlike Western dragons, they are usually kind and benevolent, and most crucially, they control the waters and not fires. Chinese dragons are rather serpentine in appearance, they usually have four legs and usually lack wings, though not always. Western cultures, on the other hand, associate dragons with evil and almost universally present them in a negative light. Think of the stories where dragons guard a princess hidden in the tower and a gallant hero has to slay the beast to get her hand in marriage. In those myths, dragons are always positioned as adversaries and antagonists, 
This is also the case in Western fantasy, where dragons tend to be antagonists. Look no further than at The Hobbit, where Smog is a talking dragon that guards a treasure. Also, this is more of a piece of trivia than anything related to what I'm talking about, but in Slavic languages, dragon has a completely different etymology. From Proto-Slavic, smog, which by itself has unclear origins, with some relating it to smikatsisiau, which would mean to slither or to creep, or a Germanic influence from snako, snake. As a child, one of the most popular children's fairy tales that I've heard is that of Smog Wawelski, a fellow that took residence in Kraków, and in order to not disturb the people, had to be fed a very hefty diet of livestock. Smog Wawelski was eventually defeated when he ate a slaughtered sheep filled with sulfur, resulting in the poor beast getting suffocated from the inside. If you're even in Kraków, be sure to pay him a visit. <laughs> Given the precedents in Western folklore and Western fantasy, it's not that surprising that Western fans tend to assume a Song of Ice and Fire dragons as evil. But the thing that is rarely noticed is that the story itself does not really present them as evil, in spite of what is usually claimed. Or rather, the dragons themselves are given nuance. Let's start with the fact that Song's dragons do not have a role that would be typical of fantasy, because they do not shield treasures. I think that our dragons by themselves are actually neutral and this is best exemplified by the three white dragons that live on Dragonstone during the Dance of the Dragons. Cannibal, Grey Ghost and Sheep Stealer. These dragons legit just kept to themselves and weren't bothering anyone, which makes them no different than other white animals. Then you look at the horrors the Valerians inflicted on everyone else using dragons and you see that yes, the dragons are also capable of causing unimaginable destruction which really isn't a groundbreaking observation, if I'm being honest. But the crucial thing is, dragons were only tools for the Valyrians. It was them who chose to use them as weapons of enslavement and colonialism. The Volantin, the Giscari and everyone else happily followed in their steps, even without dragons. Most notably though, presently, dragons are associated with the very opposite. Danish dragons are very explicitly linked to liberation her own and that of others. Nanny's second dragon dream is what gives her strength to go forward when life in the Kalasar proves very difficult for her. Day followed day and night followed night until Danny knew she could not endure a moment longer. She would kill herself rather than go on, she decided one night. Yet when she slept that night, she dreamt the dragon dream again. Viserys was not in it this time. There was only her and the dragon. Its scales were black as night wet and slick with blood. Her blood, Danny sensed. Its eyes were pools of molten magma, and when it opened its mouth, the flame came roaring out in a hot jet. She could hear it singing to her. She opened her arms to the fire, embraced it, let it swallow her whole, let it cleanse her and temper her and score her clean. She could feel her flesh sear and blacken and slot away, could feel her blood boil and turn to steam. And yet there was no pain. She felt strong and new and fierce. And the next day, strangely, she did not seem to hurt quite so much. It was as if the gods had hurt her and taken pity. Even her handmaids noticed the change. Kalisi, Jiqui said. What is wrong? Are you sick? I was, she answered, standing over the dragon's eggs that Ederia had given her when she wet. She touched one, the largest of the three, running her hand lightly over the shelf. Black and scarlet, she thought, like the dragon in my dream. The stone felt strangely warm beneath her fingers. Or was she still dreaming? She pulled her hand back nervously. From that hour onward, each day was easier than the one before it. Her legs grew stronger, her blisters burst and her hands grew calloused. Her soft tights toughened, supple as leather. Dennis' dragon dream is what saves her from suicide caused by being raped nightly by her husband and helps her adapt to the difficulties of life in the Kalasar. And that's just the eggs and the dream. Her true liberation comes from when she walks into the flames and survives, bringing dragons back from extinction. This is when she becomes queen in her own right. When the fire died at last and the ground became cool enough to walk upon, Sir Jorah Mormont found her amidst the ashes, surrounded by blackened logs and bits of glowing amber and the burned bones of man and woman and stallion. She was naked, covered with soot, her clothes turned to ash her beautiful hair, or crisped away, 
yet she was unhurt. The cream and gold dragon was suckling at her left breast, the green and bronze at the right. Her arms cradled them close. The black and scarlet beast was draped across her shoulders, its long sinuous neck cold under her chin. When it saw Jora, it raised its head and looked at him with eyes as red as coals. Wordless, the knight fell to his knees. The men of her caste came up behind him. Drago was the first to lie his arrack at her feet. Blood of my blood, he murmured, pushing his face at the smoking earth. Blood of my blood, she heard Ago echo. Blood of my blood, Ricardo shouted. And after them came her handmaids, and then the others, all the Dothraki, men and women and children, and Danny had only to look at their eyes to know that they were hers now, today and tomorrow and forever, hers as they had never been Drogos. As the nearest Targaryen rose to her feet, her black hissed, pale smoke venting from its mouth and nostrils. The other two pulled away from her breasts and added their voices to the call, translucent wings unfolding and stirring the air, and for the first time in hundreds of years, the night came alive with the music of dragons. This last scene is shown as exceedingly hopeful and magical. The revival of dragons is clearly something positive. If they were these nukes that everyone believes them to be, why make this scene clearly positive? Dragons are also linked to the revival of magic. A fine trick, announced Drago with admiration. No trick, a woman said in the common tongue. Nani had not noticed Quaid in the crowd. Yet there she stood, eyes wet and shiny, behind the implacable red like her mask. What we knew, my lady. Half a year gone, that man could scarcely wake the fire from dragon glass. He had some small skill with powders and wildfire, sufficient to entrace a crowd while his cat purses did their work. He could walk across hot coals and make burning roses bloom in the air, but he could no more aspire to climb the fiery ladder than a common fisherman could hope to catch a kraken in his nets. Lani looked uneasily at where the other had stood. Even the smoke was gone now, and the crowd was breaking up, each man going about his business. In a moment, more than a few would find their purses flat and empty. And now? And now his powers grow, Khaleesi. And you are the cause of it. Me, she laughed. How could that be? The woman stepped closer and laid two fingers on Dana's wrist. You are the mother of dragons, are you not? Alright, I just remembered that this fandom also hates magic, so it probably is only proof that they are evil. But the most important connection Danny's dragons have is still that of liberation. It is time to cross the trident, Danny thought, as she wheeled and rode her silver back. Her blood riders moved in close around her. You are in difficulty, she observed. He will not come, Krasnin said. There is a reason. A dragon is no slave. And Danny swept the lash down as hard as she could across the slaver's face. Krasnus screamed and staggered back, the blood running red down his cheeks into his perfumed beard. The harpy's fingers had torn his features half to pieces with one slash, but she did not pause to contemplate the ruin. Dragon, she sang out loudly, sweetly, all her fear forgotten. Dracarys. The black dragon spread his wings and roared. A lance of swirling dark flame took Krasnus full in the face. His eyes melted and ran down his cheeks, and the oil in his hair and beard burst so fiercely into fire that for an instant the slaver wore a burning crown, twice as tall as his head. The sudden stench of charred meat overwhelmed even his perfume, and his wail seemed to drown all other sounds. Then the plaza of punishment blew apart into blood and chaos. The good masters were shrieking, stumbling, shoving one another aside, and tripping over the fringes of their tokars in their haste. Jorgon flew almost lazily at Krasnus, black wings beating. As he gave the slaver another taste of fire, Iri and Jikwi untrained Viserion and Rhaegal, and suddenly there were three dragons in the air. When Dana turned to look, a third of Astapor's proud demon-homed warriors were fighting to stay atop their terrified mounts, and another third were fleeing in a bright blaze of shiny copper. One man kept his saddle long enough to draw a sword, but Jogo's whip coiled about his neck and cut off his shout. Another lost a hand to Rakaros Arak and rode off reeling and spurting blood. Ago sat calmly, notching arrows to his bowstring and sending them at Tokars. Silver, gold or plain, he cared nothing for the French. Strong Belvas had his Arak out as well and he spun it as he charged. Spears! Then he heard one as the poly shout. It was Grasdan. Old Grasdan in his Tokar, heavy with perils. Unsullied! Defend us! Stop them! 
Defend your masters. Spears, spears. When Rakara put an arrow through his mouth, the slaves holding his sedan chair broke and ran, dumping him unceremoniously on the ground. The old man crowded to the first rank of eunuchs, his blood pooling on the bricks. The unsullied did not so much as look down to watch him die. Rank on rank on rank they stood, and did not move. The gods have heard my prayer. Unsullied, Dani galloped before them, her silver gold braid flying behind her, her bell chiming with every stride. Slay the good masters, slay the soldiers, slay every man who wears a tokar or holds a whip, but harm no child under twelve, and strike the chains of every slave you see. She raised the harpy's fingers in the air, and then she flung the scourge aside. Freedom, she sang out. Dracarys, 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 they shouted back, the sweetest word she'd ever heard. Dracarys, Dracarys. And all around them slavers ran and sobbed and begged and died, and the dusty air was filled with spears and fire. The word that liberates the unsullied means dragon fire in Valerian. In this scene, a dragon becomes something that it's never previously been, something that liberates and not enslaves. This once again reinforces the idea that dragons by themselves are neutral. It is the person who commands them that defines what they shall become, tools of oppression and enslavement, or tools of liberation and freedom. It is Dani who makes her dragons tools of freedom, of liberation. This theme continues well into A Dance with Dragons. After dragons rampage on Daznak's pit, one of the Yunkish slaves says, I know what I saw. An old slave in a rusted iron collar was saying, as Tyrion and Penny shuffled along in the queue. And I saw that dragon ripping off arms and legs, tearing men in half, burning them down to ash and bones. People started running, trying to get out of that pit. But I come to see a show, and by all the gods of Gis, I saw one. I was up in the purple, so I didn't think the dragon was like to trouble me. Because the best spots in Daznax were at the very bottom of the pit, it was the most influential of the slaving elites that fell victim to dragon's rampage. It was also dragon who reversed the cultural script. Previously, the Giscari were more than happy to see their subjects tear each other apart, but it was not so great when they are the ones being torn apart. One of the people in the pit, Harkas, tried to be a hero and slay the dragon. He did not succeed, and how he is being perceived depends on who is speaking about him. And when a man in a blue and gold tokar began to speak of Harkas the hero, a freedman behind him shoved him to the floor. It took six brazen beasts to pull them apart and drag them from the hole. Where Harkas is called the hero, a freedman physically attacks the tokar wearing man. So, dragons, especially dragon because he tends to take the center stage, are continuously linked not to destruction, not to imperialism, not to weapons of mass destruction, but to freedom. That freedom will sometimes be messy and violent, but every campaign of liberation is. It is Daenerys who chooses to employ her dragons in her campaign, and I believe she will only continue to do so. I know what the response is gonna be because y'all are too predictable. But dragon killed a child and Danny forgot her name, mad clean incoming, dragons are nukes. Some Danny fans have been questioning whether it was really a child's body or if it was dragon who was responsible. But I don't necessarily buy into it. I believe Hazea's dad was telling the truth and that dragon really killed her. Thing is, the death of Hazea thematically serves a completely different purpose than it is claimed. Many believe that because of Hazea, Dani is destined to Nuka City to realize that her dragons are capable of bringing destruction. But the thing is, Hazea's death is precisely here to remind her of that. Yes, her dragons have their own free will, and yes, she will not control them fully, because they are not sports cars, but intelligent creatures. Daenerys already understands that her dragons are destructive. She would be very stupid if she didn't. And it is after the death of just one child that Danny locks her dragons away, aside from dragon who manages to escape. That Daenerys decides to be less restrictive with her use of dragons does not mean that she will forget the lesson of dragons being destructive. I would also go a step further and say that Hazea serves to hold Danny back in Mirin. On the Dothraki Sea, Danny re-embraces fire and blood. And in my very unpopular opinion, this means no longer walking on eggshells around the slavers, not raising everything to the ground wherever she goes. Her embracing fire and blood means not her forgetting that her dragons can wreak havoc, nor her choosing to wreak havoc wherever she goes, but her embracing the liberation her dragons are linked to fully, with all the possible setbacks it includes. Yes, some innocents will die in the campaign, 
but many of those innocents are willing to do so. And once again, these innocents do see Danny and the dragons as liberatory figures. The priest is calling on the volunteers to go to war, the half-maester told him. But on the side of right, as soldiers of the Lord of Light, Rolor who made the sun and stars and fights eternally against the darkness, Niesos and Malakuo have turned away from the light, he says, their hearts darkened by the yellow harpies from the east. He says, dragons. I understood that word. He said, dragons. I, the dragons have come to carry her to glory. Her, Daenerys. Halun nodded. Benero has sent forth the word from Volantis. Her coming is the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. From smoke and salt was she born to make the world anew. She is Azor Ahai returned, and her triumph over darkness will bring a summer that will never end. Death itself will bend its knee, and all those who die fighting in her cause shall be reborn. But John said that dragons are nukes. Now we are going to finally address that talking point. This issue came out in two separate George interviews, and during one of them that I personally saw used more often, George does not compare them to nukes, quite the opposite. One could argue that more can be learned about everyday politics from your novels than from the newspaper. I did indeed intend to make politics one of the main themes of these novels. I hope to make my readers reflect on political issues. For example, when Daenerys Targaryen conquers a city of slave traders, and tries to rule it, she realizes that good intentions alone do not make a government program. There is a series of very difficult decisions to make and, no matter what you do, people will hurt you, even if one has three dragons. Exactly, the dragons are metaphors. Virtually the nuclear weapons of your world, the most terrible weapon. However, they don't put you in a position to abolish poverty, make everyone love you, or lead a happy life. You can very well use them to burn things down, to destroy your enemies, cities, and entire cultures, but that doesn't solve the problem of good governance. It's not George who says dragons are nukes. It's the interviewer who makes a light-hearted comment. George does not elaborate on this point by saying, yes, dragons are terrible beasts, nuclear disarmament is the only possible way forward, to hint something about the nature of dragons in his books. He follows it by saying that Even if you have the strongest, most terrible weapon at your disposal, it will not make ruling any easier for you. Let's repeat. For example, when Daenerys conquers a city of slave traders and tries to rule it, she realizes that good intentions alone do not make a government program. There is a series of very difficult decisions to make, and no matter what you do, people will hate you. Even if one has three dragons. The dragons... Don't put you in a position to abolish poverty, make everyone love you, or lead a happy life. You can very well use them to burn things down, to destroy your enemies, cities, and entire cultures, but that doesn't solve the problem of good governance. This would actually be a good rebuttal to the arguments about how Dane has it easier than everyone because she has dragons. This quote, and the story proper, but they don't read it so they don't know, shows that it's precisely the opposite. Just by having dragons, Dany is not automatically a better ruler, nor does she have an easier time ruling. Dragons will not help you plan the economy, make trade deals, and all that. But they sell dragons and nuclear weapons in close proximity and jump into the air with joy. The second time this issue came out was in an interview with Le Mans. Although it all interests me, I mean, battles and wars interest me too, and... Uh... Medieval feasts interest me, and uh, you know, you, I'm creating a whole world here, and every facet of it, as I get to it, I, I try to uh, approach it as realistically as I can. But ultimately, as I said before, it's it's the human heart in conflict with itself. It's it's you know what makes Cersei Lannister the way she is, and is she capable of learning and changing? Uh, what drives Danny? You know, with Danny, I'm particularly looking at the what effect great power has upon a upon a person you know she's the mother of dragons and she controls what is in effect the only three nuclear weapons in the entire world that i've created uh what does it do to you when you control the only three nuclear weapons in the world and you can destroy entire cities or cultures if you choose to should you choose to should you not choose to these are the issues that uh, fascinate me um 
I don't necessarily claim to have answers to these. I think exploring the questions is far more interesting than just me giving an answer and saying to the reader, here, here's the answer, here's the truth. No, think about it for yourself. Look at the, look at the dilemmas, look at the contradictions, look at the problems and the unintended consequences. That's what fascinates me. This honestly just reinforces what he said in a previous interview. Even the wording seems similar at times. At no point does he say, dragons are dangerous just like nukes, nuclear disarmament is the only way forward. He says that dragons have a way to reveal Dana's character, and they thus far revealed her as incredibly selfless and compromising, because she continues to refuse to use dragons as nukes. And you can cry about that scene at the Dutraki Sea all you want, fact for the matter is, all you have is speculations until we have wins. The power the dragons give her and the capability of distraction is something that weighs heavily on her mind all throughout A Dance with Dragons. Mother of dragons, Daenerys thought. Mother of monsters. What have I unleashed upon the world? A queen I am, but my throne is made of burnt bones, and it rests on quicksand. Without dragons, how could she hope to hold Meereen, much less win back Westeros? I am the blood of the dragon, she thought. If they are monsters, so am I. One Dracarys and all of Dan's problems in Meereen melt away. Instead, she chooses to compromise, until the slavers make a fool out of her. Even if dragons are nukes, and I'm honestly not convinced still, and this seems to me like a comparison to better illustrate a point, rather than a genuine intention on George's point, the great power that she was bestowed revealed her as someone who would not senselessly relish in distraction and mass murder. And overall, George does not write allegories. He has been very clear about that, and it's what led me to believe that, yes, the comparison to nukes in this specific instance was there solely to illustrate the point and not make a big thing out of it. Finally, in a stunning revelation, when an audience member put the ridiculous question, G.R.R. Tolkien stenuously denied that his books were in any way an allegory for World War II. Have you ever been accused of writing about climate change, my proxy? You know, it being a bit of a thing in your works, the long winter. George replied, No, I haven't, not until now, and continued. Like Tolkien, I do not write allegory, at least not intentionally. Obviously, you live in the world and you're affected by the world around you, so some things sink in on some level, but if I really wanted to write about climate change in the 21st century, I would write a novel about climate change in the 21st century. So, if he wanted to write a story about the dangers of nuclear warfare, he would do that. The third thing that this proves this ridiculous argument are the comments George made after Russian invasion in Ukraine. Suddenly, nuclear war seems more and more feasible again. It's back there. We may have a nuclear war. And we have new pandemic diseases that are wiping us out. Can we be optimistic about climate change? What are we going to do if Putin actually does use nuclear bombs? What do we want to do? I wish I had a dragon I could fly to the Kremlin. Somehow, George did not say, I would hire a faceless man to kill Putin. He did not say, I would walk into Putin's dock and kill him. He said, I want a dragon to fly to the Kremlin. So, he would fly on his nuke to kill Putin to prevent nuclear war. The fourth and last thing that disproves this talking point is that George simply believes that dragons are cool. The dragons were one aspect that I did consider not including very early in the process. I was debating, should I do this as a historical fiction about fake history and have no actually overt magic or magical elements? But my friend, Phyllis Einstein, said, nah, you have to have dragons, it's a fantasy. So I dedicated a storm of swords to Phyllis, who made me put the dragons in. That was the right thing to do. Of course, the dragons work on all sorts of symbolic and metaphorical levels, but they're also just kind of cool and it's nice just to have cool elements in your fantasy. There is truly nothing subversive in Western fantasy, presenting dragons as mindless, evil beasts in need to be slaughtered by noble heroes. That's every traditional fantasy in existence, basically. I'm told left and right that A Song of Ice and Fire is all about subversion. What's subversive about dragons are nothing but nukes that have to be destroyed for everyone to live at peace? No, our dragons are neutral, and it is those who wield them that give them meaning, distraction or liberation. 
liberation from slavery, and liberation from the darkness that awaits in the North. I honestly think that it may be the link to liberation that makes the fandom hate dragons so much. Given how many people believe that slavery is actually fine and should never be touched with fire and blood, I would not be surprised. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to Draconica.com from where I took most of the information about dragons and their mysticism. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. Thank you.